Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. Uh, and today we have a very special guest, and that is Nick Cook. Uh, Nick has, has done a, a lot of excellent work, uh, and he's had quite a journey along the way, which we're going to hear about here. Uh, you know, Nick uh, wrote the best-selling book, The Hunt for Zero Point, and uh, a lot of people are going to be familiar with that terminology on, on this channel, and uh, I'm sure Nick will speak to it a little bit. Uh, but Nick was a um, a defense journalist at, at Jane's Weekly, and uh, you know he were, had reported on you know technology, classified technology, and the like, and and found himself uh, going down the rabbit hole of UFOs, and and now to consciousness because he went all the way from that to now. Uh, you know, people are going to be aware that he is a director on the board for. Uh, you know, BICS, the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies, uh, which has very familiar names on the board. If you're familiar with UFOs, UAP, and even uh, the government and DOD's psychic program, Star Project Stargate, with with Hal Putoff, right? And uh, you have Colm Kelleher and 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 people that were involved with OSAP. So those individuals were involved with the you know, the UFO study program for the DOD and uh, they had been working with Bigelow and working with Bigelow again on his consciousness studies. Uh, so we can see their ties together. So um, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see you there, Nick. And, uh, you know, welcome to engaging the phenomenon. Oh, it's great to be here, James. I have, um, you know, tuned in from afar many times and really <laughs> enjoyed the show. So I can't quite believe I'm here myself, but it's fantastic to be here. Thank you. Yeah, long, long overdue. I've been, I've been meaning to to speak to you uh, probably since the first time I saw you on on uh, Jay at Project Unity's channel. Uh, is is probably the first time I was like, oh wow, you know, Nick Nick Cook, yeah. I because you know, believe it or not, I had seen the Hunt for Zero Point book, um, a number of times, and I had never gotten around to it. And it was, it was on, you know, it's like on my my hundred books I have to read list. <laughs> Um, my hundred books to read over there. Yeah, like I'm still working my way through them. Right. Um, so, you know, for people listening, you know, how did you get? You know, we're going to be talking about UFOs or UAP and and consciousness, but you know, how did how did you get as a defense journalist? You know, for for you know a uh, prestigious defense journal, how how did you bump up against the UFO subject? Well, the truth is I didn't for a very long time. Um, I mean, I worked in aerospace and defense journalism for probably five or six years before I'd moved up to a magazine called Jane's Defense Weekly, which was quite was very well known then. It was kind of read by all the insiders. So it was a magazine for professionals. So it's for the aerospace and defense industry and for sort of intelligence insiders so most of the stuff i did was related to my beat was aerospace aviation um but occasionally because janes were sort of acknowledged as the experts we get people writing in back in the day or emailing going um i've seen something over you know my garden or the town or you know when i was out for a walk and i couldn't explain it it didn't look like any aircraft i'd ever seen um, here's a sketch of it, or here's a very blurry photograph. You're the experts. Can you tell us what it is or tell me what it is? And that fell to me. And I actually, uh, for years and years, I, I regret to have to say I ignored them. Um, I was not interested. I was really interested in the nuts and bolts of what I saw as real world aircraft programs. Um, but bit by bit, I migrated into the world of classified aerospace development. Um, I started work in the mid, early to mid 1980s. And by the end of the 80s, there were some very sort of strange and dark rumors emanating from the Nevada desert and the desert southwest of the US about strange shapes in the sky. And these related, of course, we now know to classified programs like the F-117 Stealth Fighter um, and a few drone programs. There was a lot going on then and that began to get my attention. And even though the CIA at that point had not come out saying, 
hey, by the way, we've been using UFOs as a smokescreen for some of the classified development programs that have been going on. They were actually referring at the time to the 1950s and 60s when the U-2 spy plane and the SR-71 spy plane were both being tested in secret and shielded to a degree by this kind of UAP UFO smokescreen. And, you know, we can get into this later, but that, of course, as we all know, has become more and more of a thing in the years since. And it's the misinformation and disinformation that surrounded real world programs to protect them um, has become uh, much more inventive. Uh, so, you know, all of this I had to sort of meander through, but it wasn't until... I guess it was the early 1990s, maybe early mid 1990s. And I'd been toying with this idea while I was the editor, aerospace editor at Jane's, that, you know, almost talking to myself going, OK, Nick, you've, you've been at this magazine for a few years now. It provides you with the most phenomenal access. I mean, I could, you know, through the magazine's good offices, I could pick up the phone to a defense secretary and book in an interview with them. It might take me a month or two, but I'd get there. Um, I could interview ministers back here in the UK. Um, I could pretty much travel anywhere. And when the Soviet Union opened up, I could travel even into the Soviet Union. So there were very few places in the world that were cut off to me. But far and away, the most interesting place was the US. It had the most interesting technology. Uh, I'm a quarter American myself. So I recognized that... Um, in the American psyche, there is this inventiveness, this imagination. And if you put imagination together with large amounts of dollars, you get some very, very interesting stuff come out. So I was always drawn to the US and I felt, the question I posed to myself was, okay, so you're at this magazine, you don't know how long you're gonna be there. You can get in almost anywhere. What is the biggest secret you'd ever wanna uncover? What's the thing that you, you know, you, Nick, really wanna know about? And the thing that I really wanted to know about was, you know, had there been a propulsion energy breakthrough that would give you something not unlike a UFO? And I tell the story in The Hunt for Zero Point, which is the thing that came out of that question. It was a, a book I'd not set out to write. I just was literally, every time I went somewhere interesting in the US, I would keep my eyes open. I'd ask it often impertinent questions, but always very carefully, because 25 years ago, this was massively taboo. It's still pretty taboo now, but back then it was so taboo, you couldn't talk about this stuff in polite company. So I was careful how I phrased it, but bit by bit, James, I, you know, I'd sort of amassed enough data to go, hey, I've got a book. And the book was The Hunt for Zero Point, which came out, hard to believe now, in 2001. And you know, how how did how did your hunt end? Did you, did you find the zero point? And and just just for people listening, because uh, you know what, there are a lot of new people to the UAP and UFO conversation, and they might not be mm, too aware of the direct correlation in the conversation between UFO, UAP, and zero point. Um, so just just very briefly, what is zero point, and and what did you find? Okay, so about halfway through my journey in the Hunt for Zero Point, which of course, when I set out in it, the book was untitled. I found my title when I went to meet Dr. Hal Putoff, who I'm sure will be familiar with uh, to, to many of your uh, viewers and listeners, but Hal uh, is was a laser scientist who was um, at the Stanford Research Institute and in the 1970s in an eclectic career, he set up the um, remote viewing program on behalf of the CIA. Uh, that's not why I went to see Hal. I went to see Hal because one of his many other interests is in exotic propulsion and energy. And I went to him at his laboratory in Austin, Texas I think it must have been around the mid, no, it was about late 90s, mid, mid to late 90s. And um, 
he introduced me to this idea of zero point energy and zero point energy are uh, quantum uh, quantum field fluctuations that emerge out of well nobody really knows they emerge out of a void and they disappear back into a void they are virtual particles in effect um, because they're virtual it is very hard if not impossible to draw energy from them but that was Hal's quest it's many people's quest is to extract energy from this um, zero point field and that gave me my title I thought yeah you know um, this is kind of what it is it's sort of struck me as a bit of a nexus point it certainly has done that in all the years that I've been looking into this since, because the zero point field, these quantum vacuum fluctuations are the very substrate that we can take our physical examination of the universe down to. So reality exists, if you like, in our physical world at that level. To go further than that, well, we have to go on some uh, really exploratory um, uh, endeavors. Um, and I guess that's probably where I am now, but we can come to that in due course. Yeah, and and you know it's it's uh it's a it's a good thing and interesting that you mentioned Hal Putoff because you know he's an example right of this convergence, right? He's there on the consciousness question with remote viewing. Yeah, he's there on the zero point question of um you know some people call it over unity. I mean the Casimir effect is all different kind of names that try to describe um this this principle right and um and he's there on the ufo program he's working on you know he worked on osap uh atip and um you know again we have this convergence of all these you know loose threads as, as my friends would call them uh and yet there's an intersect so um you know, I, I do, I do want to get into that intersection, especially with, um, light beyond the mountains. But, um, before we go there, I, what, what was your ultimate conclusion for the, the hunt to zero point is like, did, do you, do you think that, that we have it? Do you, and, um, let me start with that. So based on the, all the research you did and, and your hunt, for uh, zero point, do you believe that um, conventional or eat, let's just say exotic human technologies have have um, obtained that kind of um, capability? Okay, so before I directly answer that, there because there is a plot spoiler element in that, <laughs> in that uh, in a in a previous life, so. Whilst I was a journalist, I also wrote books. In fact, I started to write novels when I was very first at Jane's. Um, and I knew that when I wrote The Hump Zero Point, that, and my, my brief was I had to write it for a mainstream audience readership because it was with a mainstream publisher. So that my brief was make this accessible. So what I did was I drew on my thriller writing sort of background bona fides such as they are to give it what I like to think is sort of some page turnability. Everything that happened, happened. But it, 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 it it's ordered in a way that I hope would make you want to keep turning the page. So I am, to answer your question, I'm going to need to plot spoil <laughs> because you get to the end and it's like, is he or isn't he going to find the secret of, you know, anti-gravity, you know, which is effectively what it boiled down to. And, you know, turn away now if you don't want to hear the ending. But I don't. And I sh I I'm absolutely shameless about that because much as I would like to have found the answer myself, what I found was that it was, it was all about the journey. And, and what I thought was going to be a physical journey, I mean, and it is, I go to places ranging from, you know, the sort of uh, hinterland of Nazi Germany through into, you know, the deepest, darkest areas of the US and, and, and elsewhere. Um, but for all of its physicalness, physicality, it, it was a mental journey. It was, I was having to come to grips with 
things that I never thought I would ever have to confront because I'd come out of a nuts and bolts tradition. In fact, it couldn't be more nuts and bolts. I reported on a world of engineering and suddenly I'm faced with a world where nothing is quite what it seems. Um, it wasn't even as if this was just about classified, deeply classified exotic technology programs. There was much more to it than that. And I realized that I was really only scratching the surface. So I get into, first of all, I go into a white world of anti-gravity exotic propulsion technology. I don't find the answers there, but I find a lot of interesting stuff. And then I go into the black world, which I had some familiarity of because I was allowed into the skunk works, you know, as, as a, uh, as an aerospace editor of Jane's Defense Weekly, um, I would put in submissions for interviews with skunk works bosses. I interviewed Ben Rich. I interviewed, I think three or four skunk works bosses in my time there. So the world was quite familiar to me. It wasn't that um, off-putting, but the subject matter of the hunt for zero point was very alien to me, forgive the pun. And I, I, I was having to confront all of these things about myself as much as I was about the world that I was investigating. Oh, I haven't answered your question. Sorry. Do I find it in the end? Um, no, I, I don't. But I find enough clues, I think, to be able to put it to a jury and to go, based on the evidence, would you convict, you know, this um, world of secrecy in the sense that it has come up with exotic propulsion? Uh, man-made exotic propulsion uh, and I thought on balance that it had but the evidence this is 1990s evidence um, wasn't there to bring about a secure firm conviction and when, when you spoke to Ben Rich was there any talk about UFOs at all no I mean not at all and that was as much my fault no it was more my fault than his because I never asked the question I wasn't even focused on that the, the UFO thing was quite sidelined in the hunt uh, uh, in the book because i say I, somewhere i think at, towards the end that this has been a an investigation into man-made exotic technology i say it probably scra it does scratch the surface of the ufo question but it is not about ufos it is about this some of the things that came out of that man-made um, exotic technology uh, uh, thing, quest, hunt, might have looked like UFOs. I mean, I remember going to, to Convair, uh, General Dynamics, which then became Lockheed in Fort Worth, and I interviewed a guy called Bob Widmer. Now, Bob Widmer had designed a, uh, a Mark IV Plus ramjet powered plane in the 1950s called kingfish which went up against the a12 sr71 and the sr71 a12 won that contest and became the blackbird the losing aircraft built by bob widmer and his team at convair general dynamics was classified at the time that i interviewed bob widmer and he was so scared to talk about it that he was literally quivering he was shaking when he told me about it he didn't want to talk about it so and that aircraft was saucer shaped it had a saw he started baselining the design around a saucer so you know but it, but long and the short of it is that hunt was to look for man-made technology and i say at the end i you know i leave aside the question about what ufos are for another day and in, in, in essence that's what i'm coming to now yeah yeah and you know it, it's funny about the um you know you talked about the i guess you can say counterintelligence where they're going to protect a program and so they'll let the ufo kind of story around the classified technology fly to as a distraction um you know but on the other end of it you you also have intentional staging of ufo events 
um, which have been reported by even Dr. Kit Green talks about it. it you know, if you listen to, um, if you read Jacques Vallée's journals, you know, he makes hint of it. But if you watch the documentary Mirage Men, if you watch carefully, there's an audio clip of Kit Green saying that he had spoken to special operations people and they told him that they had um, very high tech classified helicopters that they had certain lights on it and uh, very low sound. And they were using these, you know, specifically to stage uh, UFO sightings. So, and uh, you know, of course, Jacques Vallée's uh, Forbidden Science Volume 4, he talks about um, a CIA document that he'd recovered that uh, discusses staged abductions. And that that's a whole other thing I don't even want to get into, but I'm bringing it here for the, the note of reference in regards to Kit's comment, Kit Green's comment, and that um, the counterintelligence, you know, regarding uh, classified technology, let's say black world technology um, to, to hide a program. But then at the same time, it's it's also used the other way around. Um, which again, it's just an in interesting note I, I want to bring up. Um, well, just if I can grab 30 seconds on that. Um, it is interesting. I, I, I talk about this a little bit in the new book and it, it's it's about you know where you get that intersection again between things like classified helicopters and uh exotic uap stuff which which might look like a helicopter but it's actually not one right right so um i i i tell a, a story in the new book about how i went up to um Dulcie, uh, in fact, uh, you know, wow, uh, yeah, to Mesa, Very cool. yeah, uh, and um, I interviewed a guy that is quite well known for the mutilations that took place on his family's ranch. He's called Edmund oh. Gomez. Okay, wow, yeah, uh, and so we were talking, and he was showing me this bone. I mean, it was a, a graveyard of bones that had just been sort of scooped up from various cows that had been mutilated, mutilated on his farm, on his ranch, and scooped into a pit. And we were standing there. And he told me about how on one occasion that he'd seen what he took to be a black helicopter, which yeah. had appeared over his ranch. The next thing he knew, the next day, there was a dead mutilated cow. And he said, uh, well, you know, he said, I thought this was a, a classic flying saucer that, that had appeared until this thing lit up the cockpit lights. And in the reflection of the cockpit lights, I saw a rotor. Yeah. Well, that, that was, this was a long time ago and it set me on a sort of path. And I thought, okay, well, why don't I, I again, I'm at Jane's Defense Weekly. I can ask questions. So I remember I walked into, I was at a trade show and I walked into a, a famous helicopter manufacturer's um, chalet there. And I got a whole load of people together in a room who were advanced military technologists. And I didn't relate the story because I would have been literally drummed out of the trade show if I'd started talking about UFOs. Yeah. This was in the mid 1990s. But I started asking them about stealth helicopters. This yeah. was long before any he stealth helicopters made an appearance in the Bin Laden raid. And I remember there was a guy from, I, I can't remember whether it was Boeing or Bell. Anyway, one of them, he turns to his colleague and says, what are we telling? And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm on the right track here. Yeah. Anyway, I, I do relate this story further in the book. Suffice to say, there is a very interesting confluence, a sort of crossover between those two worlds. But let me say that whatever there may be in the stealth helicopter field is not um, explained by, you know, the stuff that people like Ed Edmund Gomez traditionally see over their ranches it just cannot be it is too strange so you know anyway yeah and, you know, and it, that, you know and uh, i guess we can say your colleague from bix uh, column kelleher talks about these different layers um and even mimicry where there's a ufo event or you know what have you and then there's 
um, classified technology uh, that's utilized covert technology, you know, whether it's a state actor or aerospace company or whatever, you know, however that, that all is organized, um, you know, and then again, that the, there's a, there's a mimicry from the UFO phenomenon and it, it, it becomes hard to tell, you know, what, what's actually going on in, in the bigger picture, you know, cause why is the, um, say the military or this contractor group doing whatever they're doing? Like, what are the, what are they actually doing? Do you think? You're right. I mean, it all gets chucked into this big pot that we can call, and I know this is a subject close to your heart as well, because I've heard you talk about it to others. Um, it, it's the reality pot. This is, now we are butting up against, actually very early on in this discussion, but we're butting up against the interface. You know, this is Donald Hoffman's interface writ large, where we as human beings perceive reality, um, a reality that is, I don't know what you want to call it, um, rendered into existence by us perhaps. Um, but we only get to see a slice of a much deeper reality, Hoffman argues, and I agree with him. Um, and behind that interface, which we could broadly equate perhaps to the graphical user interface on our on our laptops on our computers behind that interface there is a whole world of uh bits and bytes and you know uh electromagnetic um fields and currents and stuff that i don't need to understand on my computer and evolution has just given us so much you know enough that we can handle and no more. I mean, this is the argument. And, and I think that um, it's a very good one, actually, because if you begin to think of reality in that way, anything which gets thrown at the screen, and, you know, we were talking a moment ago about man-made technology, um, disinformation gets thrown at the screen, uh, mimicry by God knows who or what, um, all of this gets swirled up into that interface. And lo and behold, every now and again, reality gets bent out of shape. And you get what Jacques Vallée would call, and Eric Davis, all kinds of high strangeness effects. So it makes investigation um, very confusing and difficult. It's not easy, uh, which is why if you are interested in this stuff, I think you have to say to yourself, I certainly try to, to me, be patient. You know, it is it is about the journey again. I'm, I'm back where I was with the hunt for zero point. It, it's experience the journey and perhaps experience and enjoy if you can. And I, you know, I use this reservedly because for many people it is not enjoyable, it's confusing. But um, uh, appreciate, if you like, you know, the waypoints of the journey, because it's, you know, in some senses, I think it's our future. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you know, getting to, you know, you mentioned the word interface a few times. So I'm, I'm going to bring up something relative. All right. Um, kind of that's going to lead into different parts of the conversation. So as, as somebody who is a defense journalist, you know, what, what do you think when you see slide nine? Oh, fascinated. Uh, sh should we just say for anyone who doesn't know what slide nine is, that it's a slide from an ATIP yeah. briefing document. Yeah. yeah. Um, and whilst its provenance is not entirely clear, I think we all know that it's genuine or so. it certainly seems to be ah. There we you go. Know, for people, for people here, here is slide nine. I keep a copy by me at all times. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna pin this up in the background. And there's a lot of uh, interesting things <laughs> on the slide. Um, yeah. You know. But it is. And, and I'll, so you asked me the question about what do I think as a former defense journalist? 
the 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 way that slide that briefing document is constructed is so familiar to me i mean you know i sat through umpteen dod briefings with that similar kind of slide format to it so for me whilst you can never be sure there was little doubt of its genuineness um and, but the things that it mentions on it are of course you know i talked earlier about this is why I loved going to the States, you know, and covering <laughs> high tech was because where you get money and imagination, you get some seriously exotic ideas come out. And you know, that to me was just a, um, a clear example of that. You know, this is, these are people who are really thinking out of the box, who've had time and some money um, to enable them to think out of the box. And slide nine for me is 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 evidence of that and and very interesting. Yeah, because you know, there's there's some interesting notes here that I just want to bring up on slide nine. Uh, you know, and again, for its um for people that might question its authenticity, um, you know, one one of my colleagues I accidentally leaked it, if you want to say it that our my good friend known as a uh, Twitter user J or the mind sublime. And with that, um, it wasn't just the slide that we got. We got the, um, the original uh, Nimitz report. Um, it was unredacted, which we pulled because we, there was information on there that shouldn't be public. Um, and uh, Lou Elizondo's resignation letter, you know, so that it had provenance to it. Uh, but, you know, again, one of the things on the slide here, it says what was considered phenomena is now quantum physics, um, which I thought is very interesting. And again, the, again, it says DOD advantages. It says <laughs> DOD has been involved in similar experiments in the past, you know, and it's it, the stuff that it's talking about here is um, psychotronic weapons cognitive human interface penetration of solid surfaces instantaneous sensor disassembly alteration manipulation of biological organisms anomalies in, in space time construct which kind of reminds me of a uh, help put off time space metric um unique cognitive human interface experiences which is kind of reminding me of um interactions with non-human intelligence maybe um and of you know of course it has this major kind of headline which i i guess is you know reason for the department of defense to consider uap a, a genuine national security threat right it's kind of why we're having this conversation now is because this was finally pushed in the public as as um national security and therefore it's a liability issue you can't ignore it and it's been proven i think um not saying that the UFOs are an imminent threat, but, you know, again, these things are things of concern and, and what have you. And, uh, you know, this inter interesting statement says the science exists for an enemy of the United States to manipulate both physical and cognitive environments in order to penetrate U.S. facilities, influence decision makers, and, and comprise, compromise national security. Um, so, again, that, that's just interesting. And, um the cognitive human interface part is uh, always stands out to me. I had Lua Lozano on and I asked him about that. And in, in reference to that, he said that that's kind of like your CE5, you know? So that's um, for, for everybody watching this is probably going to be aware of it. It's, you know, uh, a consciousness interaction with, with um, non-human intelligence. So, you know, as, as you're so, yeah, uh, this defense journalist, you're coming, you know, you get the hunt for zero point, you're kind of broaching that, and then you get tangled into the UFO subject, and then the the consciousness subject. Um, and you know, you, you you talked about your journey, right? Uh, of of the whole thing. So as as somebody who who went through that journey. You know, in retrospect, do these pieces make sense to you? Oh, in retrospect, they do. Right. At the time, 
many of them made no sense whatsoever. There were, you know, junctions, junctures in my life that made no sense. I look back and they go, oh, okay, that's what it was about. You know, yeah. Oh, totally. It, it, it's fascinating. Okay. So what what do you what do you think is responsible for um, the instigation of those events? Uh, the way in which they happen and then the, the realization you had of them. Okay. Uh, again, I'm sorry to sort of, I'm going to preface various questions, answers to questions of yours, James, by saying, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to say <laughs> a lot. And I'm also going to say, uh, I have no fixed position on the phenomenon. And in right. fact, I've always said to myself, the day that I do, I might as well go and do something else because actually I think it is a, an evolving phenomenon. So I'd be very unwise to, to have a fixed position on it. Um, but also I'm just relentlessly curious. So uh, every time I, you know, I, some new day, piece of data comes my way that, you know, confounds some previous assumption that I'd made. And it was only in a, probably an internal assumption um, it reminds me that I need to think flexibly, you know, about all of this. So, um, uh, and after all of that, I've forgotten the question. What did you ask me again? Um, kind of like, how, how do you see, hmm, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to pose it in a way as like, as if it's by some grand design. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. sorry, I, I remember. And I remember what I was, I was going to say which is, so here is an assumption that I am currently intrigued by, which is, you know, and you can look at this sort of from a spiritual perspective, I think, but you can also look at it from a computing standpoint. And that is that the data as it began to confront me suggested to me that and it's this is not a by the way a unique uh viewpoint of mine you hear it in the work of donald hoffman you hear it in the work of other people as well that we are uh, not just humanity but actually everything uh, that is material and physical and energetic is part of a, a feedback mechanism into right. something that resembles a very um intelligent machine and now if you were to take this the, the spiritual side of that you would say that god in his or her wisdom creates the universe but he or she has no means of telling exactly what he or she has created so th they need a feedback mechanism to tell them how that thing uh works to the degree that every experience that we experience from intense pain to joy and love and everything in between, you know, that is something that gets conveyed back as do all pieces of information back into the architecture of the, of the creation, whether that is again, a spiritual thing or a machine like thing. And it expands the, uh, the, the the software base and the intelligence of the machine to become more intelligent. So it is a self-learning, evolving machine, which looks like it is just crunching problems, big, huge data sets. And uh, I have no proof of that, no evidence of that. Who does? But, you know, that currently, as I said, is a, an assumption for me that is intriguing and seems to tick a lot of boxes but you know um like i say uh something might come along tomorrow which confounds that completely but that's sort of where i am at the moment yeah and that's this um this kind of interactive quality um uh to reality which um, Dr. John Wheeler of Pearl Labs would have said is the participatory universe, the participant, you know, that we're participating in, in, in reality that, um, you know, we're not merely, um, passive observers, but our, our act of observing actually affects 
the thing itself, right? And it's like a self-informed, self-actualizing uh, universe, right? Almost like a organic AI, right? Yeah. Mechanism. It's just, it's incredible to even contemplate, right? Like we're just kind of seeing it on like we're building it on such small scales, and you know, it's like a self-informed um, reality in that way. But, um, you know, getting to that kind of the interaction, the because there's this, like you said, this feedback, right? And with with that, I'm trying to put this into good words, you know, I, kind of in 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 the context of um, your your new book, which which is going to be on Substack, correct? Yeah, it's actually it's on Substack now. I I I just put it on there. Um, it's called The Light Beyond the Mountains, and yeah, that's my new book. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we're we're getting more into that conversation now. So, you know, just so people are aware, you know what 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 is this book, and uh, what where does the name come from? So uh, the first thing I should say is that I'm serializing it on sub Substack. So I'm going to be writing it chapter by chapter and then posting it and publishing it. So it's a bit Dickensian, if you'll allow me, in its format, in that that's how Charles Dickens got going himself. He, he serialized you know, works like Great Expectations and Oliver Twist. Um, but that aside... I decided Substack would be an interesting platform to do this on. Uh, I, In the introduction that I just posted on Substack, which gives the background to the book, um, I'm quite clear that originally I had tried to get this published as a as a as a normal book. I mean, through a normal yeah. publisher. You know, I'm fortunate to be published by some uh, some 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 good international publishers, but. The, the the thing that frustrated me and which led me to Substack in the end was that, you know, every time I pitch for a book, I have to come up with a proposal. The proposal is, I don't know, sort of anything from 10 to 15,000 words long. And I originally said to the my agent, I want to write a book on consciousness. And he went, great, you know, fine, you know, give me a proposal. So I wrote this proposal. And then he came back and went, well, the problem is, is, you know, publishers like to feel that they've got an expert talking about this stuff. You're not an expert in consciousness. And I said, well, you know, uh, uh, hello, uh, no one is or everyone is because actually it's not understood where it comes from. So everyone is entitled to have an opinion on it. I said, but I take your point. You know, I, I, I am I don't have a Ph.D. in psychology or, you know, whatever. So I'm going to reframe this now. Uh, what if I came back to it through something that I am qualified to talk about, which is UFOs or UAP, because of my defense journalistic background, you know, my aerospace editor's background. So he went, great. So he, I said, so I'm going to give this a UAP front end. That's going to be my portal of entry into this consciousness story. But the story I really want to tell is the consciousness one. So he went, great, we're on. So I wrote another proposal and I sent that in. And uh, this time that this was submitted to the publisher and the publisher came back and went, uh, this is great. Uh, we're going to make an offer. Um, and before it actually translated into hard cash, someone had a bit of a rethink because they were going, well, actually, we're not <laughs> quite sure what this book is about. Is it about UFOs or is it about consciousness or is it about something in between? And I... I sort of went with this for a while and then I said, well, actually, for my money, it is impossible to put into a proposal of 10,000 words, 12,000 words, what I'm trying to say here. It's just I can I can do it in the book form because the book gives me the expansion, the space to be able to write about that. But I can't do this in 10,000 words. So you know what? Let's take it off the market and I'm going to put it on Substack where I'm going to serialize it week by week or, or fortnight by fortnight, actually. Um, and that's what I'm doing. So uh, the why is it called the light beyond the mountains? Um, a number of reasons. There are, as people will see, there are allegories um, 
and there are allusions too to this light symbolism throughout. Um, the sort of slightly wishy-washy response is that I am a very hopeful person by nature. The light on the horizon is meant to be something um, hopeful that we are all, you know, in what, let's face it, are some pretty dark times. Um, we ultimately are moving towards, or at least I feel we are. But, you know, there are other um, illusions and, and allegories too to the light. I mean, and the I guess the one which runs through the book like a stick of rock, uh, words in a stick of rock, are um, my very first, I've only ever had, well, I've only ever seen a UFO once. And um, back in the day, a long time ago, I did, sad to say, quite a lot of hanging around outside Area 51. No. Uh, and I was there in, as I describe in the prologue of the book, which I'm about to to post. Um, I describe how on a hot September's night, colleague and I, we'd staked out the base. You know, we were looking for exotic aircraft. I wasn't looking for flying saucers. Um, and suddenly up behind the mountain range, uh, I guess 15, 20 miles away, right where the base is or was, was it or is, came this ball of orange light. Um, and in my reference library of known things that I can tick this off against, there is nothing. I, I can't equate it to anything that I know exists in the world, of, even of you know, classified aircraft technology. Um, and this becomes the sort of, I suppose, the, the motif for the pursuit of truth in the book. I want to know what I saw. And that leads me, believe it or not, into the whole consciousness question, because, you know, as you've said, James, and I've, you know, seen you say, in fact, we've touched on in the whole CE5 issue, there is a connection between UAP and consciousness. It may not be very clear, um, but anyone who has ever practiced or indulged in CE5, um, I've not, uh, but they will, you know, frequently report that these things show up. So what is that about? Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I dive into some of that in the book, but it, it's a very, it is designed to be um, a, not a skeptic's journey, but someone who is very um, rigorous, data-driven, needs to be uh, confronted with a lot of evidence before he is tilted one way or another. Um, that is the start of the journey. Um, and by various extraordinary twists and turns, which may or may not have been organized by a high, higher power, but certainly when I look back on them, they seem to have uh, some intelligence behind them and not my own, not exclusively my own. Um, I am, you know, drawn into this, I, for my money, compelling story about what consciousness is and who we are and uh, all of that. So that, that is the journey and it is the light which pulls me through that journey. Yeah. And, you know, in regards to CE5 or, you know, consciousness and UFOs, consciousness and UAP, uh, you know, here we have the, again, slide nine, that's kind of addressing that issue. Um, talking about cognitive human interface and the, and the interaction um, where it shows, you know, the, or it talks about UFOs having the ability to interact with uh, thought and consciousness. But, all, you know, also you have the, the entire UFO literature that, it, you know, it, it, you know, it's almost hard to come by uh a list of UFO encounters and there's not reporting of an interactive component that, that occurs consciously, right. Um, whether it be telepathy or downloads, um, all, all, all types of different interactions in that way. And, you know, even 
Jacques Vallée and, and Dr. Eric Davis in their in their paper on high strangeness talk about the one out of the, the six layers uh, is, you know, one of them is the psychic effect, you know, and, and Jacques Vallée even in the Invisible College talks about this, uh, the case of Dr. X, where there, you know, there's a whole um, psychic effect, but uh, even, a, you know, again, for lack of a better word, spiritual transformation that this individual has. And, um, you know, you know, one of my things with that is, you know, spiritual is, is just the word we're, we're using to try to point in a specific direction of something. Um, when we're talking about anything, um, it's, it's not, you know, w within itself, nothing is, 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 is non-spiritual you know, <laughs> in a sense, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're, if you're talking about consciousness, right? The whole thing itself. Um, so actually, you know, a, a good question is, you know, during, during that, um, that sighting that you had, w was there any kind of consciousness thing that you either felt in, or, or was there any kind of interaction like that? No, I w really wish I could report there was. It was, I, I remember, and bear in mind, I was with a colleague. Oh, um, I, 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 I should, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I should just say directly. Because... In the sense of... Because it was, in, in a sense, an impetus for something. So was oh, that... Was yes. that... in well, Okay, so was yeah. that intentional? Uh, who knows? Right. Uh, and, it's like it gets. If, yeah. if it was, it had a, it's had a very delayed effect because, yeah, but... as I describe in the book again, um, after I wrote the Humphrey Zero Point, I took a massive sabbatical from all of this. I, I uh, the book came out in two thousand and one. Uh, I didn't touch that subject again for sixteen years. In fact, it was when the New York Times article came out in 2017, that I went, hmm, this is interesting, because this looks like it's been really well sourced. Of course, I, you know, I, I'm now fortunate enough, as you are, to know the authors of that story, and, you know, to know how, how well it was, you know, dug out and put together, um, despite a few, uh, you know, sort of reporting slip ups, but that's all in it. Um, so, but that that story sort of kindled, sort of rekindled a kind of spark in me, which until then had just been absolutely dead for 16 years. And I made a few calls to some old contacts and friends. You know, I rang up Hal, Hal Putoff and a few other people. And I said, what's going on here? Is, is this real? And he went, well, I think it is. You know, this, <laughs> this looks genuine. And and it was remarkable, you know, as everyone else has attested to in this, how that same article became a, a, a sort of catalyst for people being allowed to talk about this stuff, you know, where they hadn't before. And I even rang up, started to ring up aerospace engineers and they'd gone, have you seen that piece in the New York Times? And, and people were talking about it. So it, it all lay dormant in me. That whole sighting, if it, if it had it been planted there with intentionality back in 1992 to act as a trigger in 2017 for my latent interest in all of this well maybe but you know in which case we are dealing with a very very patient phenomenon um which of course we are because in its thing world universe time and space don't exist they do in ours or appear to i mean they do in ours but we conjecture, at least I conjecture, as do a lot of people, that, you know, since space and time are the best we can do to wrap um, a system around our universe at the moment. Um, and, but it seems as if that framework is beginning to crack and fall apart and that something else is emerging to replace it. Not that... Um, you know, general relativity and quantum mechanics are going to be redundant. I don't think they will be for a second, but they will be subsets of this greater um, scientific understanding of our world and our universe. Um, I think that's what's coming. Um, 
so uh yeah i mean this is a very patient phenomenon if if anything we have just been talking about holds true well and and yeah i mean patient cuz it, it, it would seem right um that this this phenomenon has been with us from the beginning beginning of human history as far as we can tell um and i i obviously that's speculative but mm, sure. i you know, I think that it it seems that way. You know, if you're talking about religions, you know, basically every religion, um, not everyone, but m- most of them, the underlying theme is that humans are interacting with a greater intelligence, right? Um, and we give these greater intelligences names and, you know, and we have a culture and, and what have you. Um, and that's a whole other discussion. It is, James, but it, it, it's worth pointing out that whilst we clearly are interacting uh, with a higher intelligence, we may be part of that intelligence ourselves. In other right. words, there is a sort of fractal argument, isn't there? That yeah. that we are part of that intelligence. And, you know, if, if we are that feedback mechanism that provides data, information, whatever, back into the system to help it to learn and grow, then, you know, that would sort of make sense. I mean, another way of looking at it, and again, I just offer this as speculation, conjecture, and all the rest of it, because who knows? Um, But, you know, it it, it has been said that, what, let me reframe this, what better way would there be to, for the universe to experience itself uh, or creation to experience itself, than to drop us into a quote school where we learn in a framework or almost like a prison that is constructed of space, time, and quantum mechanics. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Earth school I suspect is is designed to be quite hard, and certainly in some of those spiritual um, teachings, you know, we hear that that this is not an easy place to come and learn. And, but you learn quickly. And of course, we learn in a linear way because that is what space time, space and time give us. Um, So uh, again, I'm throwing this up as sort of just teasing thoughts and and, and, and speculations. Um, And in the book, I mean, certainly in in the light beyond the mountains, whilst I might go into some of this stuff, it is still, I try to do what I did in The Hunt for Zero Point and some of the other books that I've written, which is to make this a story that you can relate to. Because there's, there's, it's no good my, yeah, you know, I've read umpteen books on this subject that fascinates us. Um, I, I can't better that. I can't improve what any of these people have done the only thing i think i can do and add to here is to let readers experience the 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 journey in a sense as i did and i moved from this as i say this very hard and fast nuts and bolts perspective of the world to various points in my life where that shifts where the solidity of the ground under my feet um, isn't so solid anymore. And it gives way to some new perspective. But in time, that perspective starts to feel solid. And I adjust and acclimatize to that. And then something else happens, which reshapes and reforms my worldview again, and gets me to, you know, this whole new position where I, you know, I'm able to look back from where I came and try to make that journey make sense. Now, that's what I want to do in this book. I want to make it very accessible to people who, for whom this whole subject would be otherwise quite scary. And and in the book, um, to, to what extent are you mm, investigating or approaching and discussing the UFO phenomenon and to what extent is it consciousness based, the question of consciousness? 
I do go there. Um, I've, I go there quite early on, actually, in, in the book to talk about the UFO phenomenon. But I do, I, I, I look at some of its twisty sort of, man, I was about to say man-made aspects, but some of the, some of, some of the man-made areas of confusion. So, you know, the, the disinformation realm uh, rears its head quite quickly. Uh, and, you know, that obviously is there to, to confuse us. And I try to use, you know, such skills as I've derived over the years to unpick and unpack some of that. Uh, and But later on, and, and then we do get into the UFO phenomenon as it has revealed itself to us post-2017. Um, and I do unpick and unpack some of that, but I use it again as a waypoint to this bigger question of consciousness and reality. Um, but, I, you know, there are some fantastic, I've met some wonderful people who have told me about some of the extraordinary things that have happened to them in their encounters. Um, and perhaps I, I, I will leave some of those examples for another time, but um, they are there, they're there in the book. And again, you know, there's a sort of, I, 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 well, Sarah, you know, we all know there are dark aspects to this, Lord knows there are, but uh, in, in the book, I do always, I try to pursue that light, the light of the title. Um, and there is actually, I will just briefly describe a, a chap I came to have quite a few discussions with who lives in the US and who had been going through a terrible time from a sort of mental health perspective, um, lost his way somewhat, uh, and then had well, actually asked for help. Um, I suppose a little bit like Chris Bledsoe did, and not that I I know Chris. Right, well, we've right. we've had yeah. discussion. I don't really know Chris, but I, I think that's sort of at, at at root of of you know his story. Um, anyway, this guy asks for help, and he is given a series of downloads, uh, almost like a sort of sh in a shamanistic tradition, to how to of how to cure himself. And he goes through this these rituals, which are dietary in nature, but really austere, you know, uh, uh, quite terrifying. And at the point towards the end where he's almost at death's door, he feels a sort of release, you know, something gives. And it's not just about him physically, it's about him mentally and spiritually. And he starts to improve, he feels better. His mental health returns bit by bit. And after this, um, after this, several weeks of feeling better, he is strolling on a beach near his home, and he asks, in his moment of thanks to the phenomenon, for it to reveal itself to him. And uh, he's drawn to look up in this moment, and he sees a, a sphere, a metallic sphere, an orb, and he actually films it, and he sends me the film, so I have the film of it. But then uh, it hovers around for a while and then it drifts off. And just before it disappears, it becomes plasma-like and then vanishes. Yeah. Now, what does that say about our reality? Well, I don't know. But everything I'd ever taken to be solid in this world cannot really be as solid as I think or thought it was for that whole encounter to have taken place. Is is this individual under a pseudonym, or in, in the book is it under their real name? I haven't written it yet because it's towards the end. Okay. But, uh, so I haven't quite decided. Um, I will, I will seek his permission. Um, yeah. Before uh, before I do. Yeah, and you know that's very. I mean, again, what you're describing, um, very um, CE five like. Uh, you know, we can call it contact modalities, where you know, forget about any protocols, right? What we're talking about here is the bigger picture of it. The idea that um, 
this individual, you know, had this uh, asked for help and had these um, downloads asked for like a sign, a sighting or a revelation. And, and lo and behold, uh, an experience occurs, you know, so that is, um, you know, you hear that time and time again in the contact and, and CE5 or contact modality literature, contact work. Um, so I, I'm and you can all sorry for interrupting. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just felt it was an important point. You know, Diana Walsh Pazilka's work, uh, you know, about the sort of religiosity of the phenomenon. Um, you can see in examples like that one, the one I've, I've just mentioned, how it is that these two worlds are now sort of merging and combining. And because there is so much in his experience of that phenomenon, which sort of bespeaks um, a religious encounter in you know centuries or millennia past. So, yeah, I mean, I, I to begin with, when I first read Jacques Vallée and I read him, I don't know, 30 years ago or, or more to begin with, I didn't, sorry, Jacques, because I know him. Um, I didn't, um, I didn't get it. I just didn't understand right. what he was what? talking about. I didn't, it was beyond my frame of reference. I was so stuck and steeped in technology and looking at this you know, in that silo of technology that uh, I, I, I just, I couldn't take on board what he and the likes of, you know, John Keel were, were, were trying to say. I do now, or at least I think I do, but um, it's taken a while. And that, that's why not only the phenomenon is patient, but I think you, one has to be patient in this and go, yeah, it, 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 it'll it reveal itself if that's what you want, but, you know, don't, don't hurry it. <laughs> yeah. As my, my friend, uh, the hermetic penetrator would say, um, it has a very like a uh, hermeneutical cycle of um, unveiling itself in layers and, you know, even just on a psychological level. Um, and that, you know, this also gets into the disinformation, right? We're being told by the establishment, or at least were for 80 or so years, that this doesn't exist. It's a non-issue. Um, not only that, the denial ridicule factor, um, not only that, um, direct harm that has come to individuals um, by the establishment uh, as, as David Grush has claimed, right? And uh, I believe in one of his recent things, he talked about when you're read into these programs, the UFO programs, I know I know your things about the light and the mountain and we're going to get the, you know, I'm super positive. Yes, I, I, I'm optimistic as well. But, uh, you know, some of these individuals, these whistleblowers, are, I'll probably say all of them have, um, you know, threat of execution as you know, a deterrent from sharing this kind of information. Um, yeah, um, they've, I mean, s suffered tremendously. I, I mean, I've not had the pleasure of meeting David Grush yet. Um, but, I, you know, the bravery of these people is, is, is phenomenal. Uh, and, but, you know, that's, I, you know, when I was a reporter, I, you know, I, I, I saw what happened to people when they crossed the line. So, you know, it, it's if you've signed the Official Secrets Act, and and of course I've not because I've never needed to. I was just a reporter. But um, you know, you 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 are confronted with an action that you know your conscience your conscience tells you you need to take but you know you are going to cross a threshold that is going to get you into a you know world of shit. And um, so I admire the bravery of these people who are led by their conscience to do what they do. Um, there we go. Yeah, that's a, that's a different thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, back to the kind of experience aspect, um, you know, I mean, for me, I, you know, it wasn't until I I, I had a, even a number of experiences 
that I realized, like, at least for me on, on the, like the contact end is that you can talk about the subject. Um, but it's, I can understand why if, if somebody didn't have the firsthand experience, why it would be hard to have that kind of, mm, cause it's not just an intellectual curiosity thing, right? It's, um, you know, especially after experience, it's, uh, there's a realization of like a integration, right? Like you have to integrate that experience and, and things like fall into place and you're like, holy, holy shit, right? <laughs> you know, like this is real. Um, and you have that kind of breakthrough and, you know, getting to the, the gentleman's experience, how it went from a metal sphere to kind of like plasma and then dematerialization, right? You know, so one thing I've often said is like the the UFO phenomenon is like a um, a bridge between uh, the physics and the metaphysics, because you have uh, what we can see or or think of as a physical object, right? It looks like technology, and it's you know could be tracked on radar. Uh, there could be alleged retrievals of these objects. You could have gun camera footage of them. Uh, yet they demonstrate uh, principles which we would consider metaphysical uh, or quantum or, you know, whatever kind of word you want to use to describe the ineffable, the things that we don't understand how that's occurring, but, but yet we, but we're, we're watching it happen still, right. Even if we don't understand it. So, you know, that's one reason I think that, mm, the UFO phenomenon is, is important to the consciousness question because it's like a stepping stone. It's like you can observe it from the beginning to the end of how it goes from this physical object into the consciousness question of sure. I'm, you know, here's this um, object and, but then I have this download and then I have a, a synchronicity, right? <laughs> Which, so th this is a question I have for you is, there, you know, obviously there's like the download thing and it's like, okay, can we attribute, could we attribute that download to interaction with non-human intelligence where it's something that the non-human intelligence is communicating and interacting with us in one way, right? But then there seems to be this other level, right, where it's the feedback consciousness thing where if there's this crazy set of uh, synchronicities in, in a certain way, like I don't, I don't, in my opinion, think that that like that entire thing was designed by non-human intelligence. Right. I think that it, there's another level at play. Right. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, from, from we have influence and interaction with non-human intelligence to this other level. Yeah. Like you um, and others, I sense no more than that, but uh, you can perhaps begin to put together a picture that at least makes sense to, to you, to one, um, that speaks to that higher intelligence first, that source intelligence as the sort of the, the master orchestrator, if you like. Um, but I think you can also detect the presence of uh, interloper intelligences, if you like that. Right. I like that. Penetrate, penetrate that space, um, and so you can. You know, I suppose if you were to equate it to a, a computing analogy again, you know this this is this is hackable. It is, um, and in some senses, I think that's actually what slide nine speaks to. That this is. Yeah. a hackable resource uh which regrettably um as slide nine again sort of demonstrates <laughs> is conceived of and viewed as a potential uh weapon space you know right. it is uh yeah again i mean i you know i've come out of umpteen briefings where i'm in my past where i've been informed about you know new new war forms new types of um 
uh, technologies that that will change the shape of the battle space you know not yeah. even the battlefield the battle space you know that was and you know the beginnings of a new term when you know i was a cub reporter and then you had things like info war you know information warfare you know this is a new war form and it's going to change the um it's going to change the uh, the, the 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 world of uh, battle space um and and you know potentially we are seeing another one here which is um, how do you corrupt the reality space? Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it says something about our world that that is where we are, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, and sadly, any and all of this is up for grabs. Yeah, so you don't see Project Stargate uh, looking for medical cures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. uh, well... Well, but it's it's funny though that you do get people, you know, and and you know, Diana um, Walsh Pazalka again, you know, has spoken about this in her books, where you get individuals who right. have feel called to design certain technologies or things which benefit humanity, and and I remember attending a really fascinating briefing at MIT organized by um, a former uh, aerospace colleague who uh, he referenced um, a remote viewer who I'm sure is known to you or, you know, her name is Kay Randall May. Have you come across of Kay? Course. Yeah, she was, I mean, people, I'm, I'm just going to put it out there because it's already public. She was the one that is in this interview thing with Dr. Kit Green. The, the audio leaked. It's out there, but yes. Yeah. Well, Kay, um, Kay was a remote viewer who worked with various academics uh, in uh, exploring technologies that could be downloadable from the ether, you know, the universe. Yeah. And uh, we were shown multiple, you know, examples of references to um, technologies that do good. Um, and so, you know, for all of the ones that, you know, where we might get the military looking for stuff that's going to confer military advantage, at least perhaps in the private sphere, there are people who are looking for other stuff, which can, you know, literally benefit humanity. Um, I'm not having a go at the military here, by the way, um, you know, having come out of a fraternity where I see, obviously, there are clear benefits to uh, what the military provides us with in a responsible, sustainable way, which is protection. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just want for this stuff to, the madness to kind of stop. And yeah. uh, the cycle of um, progressive threat escalation to go away. But, you know, that maybe that's well, a dream. And, you know, I, I, yeah, again, maybe both of us are optimistic, but I, I really do see the, the UFO issue as one that has the ability if we you know we take that opportunity as a uniting factor you know if if it was disclosed to humanity right not just the united states or uk that we're not alone there's a non-human intelligence um you know hopefully it's not put out there like it's a, like it's we have to be worried because it's a threat to us kind of thing i hope that doesn't happen um but you know that there's a non-human intelligence that would kind of be like when you know when me or this gentleman you talked about or whoever had this contact experience right there's almost like this transformational thing that that occurs right that we can have a paradigm shift like that on a collective level um if we were to know that basic fact you know yeah oh, i i think uh it's hard to conceive of a world in which that you know manifestation of N nhi non-human intelligence is you know delivered um as as a fact uh where it would not have that effect you, you it's hard to conceive of that um so you know we've had an interesting few years haven't we and who knows what 2024 is going to bring but i you know i often get the sense that particularly when the phenomenon is, when people seek to contain it in some way, 
that it just finds expression somewhere else. Yeah. So God knows where it will find expression in 2024, but <laughs> um, it, it might be an interesting year. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, is, I, you know, I don't want to spoil your, the book and, and the sub stack and everything, but for um, the, the light beyond the mountains, do you have um, particular themes and or chapters that you would like, um, not to flesh out, but just to kind of bullet list off, like these are some things that are going to be discussed in the book and explored. Uh, yeah. Um, so a very sort of briefly, and this will only capture a part of it. Um, it does move through a very, I mean, a, a world I hope that initially will feel comfortable and familiar. And I'm only slightly sniggering at that because the comfort is based in the fact that I, I'm talking about quite real world technologies, but in a sense, and also to, again, let the reader know that you're not going to jump into the deep end here. You, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you into the shallow end and we're going to, we're going to swim together towards the deep end because there's a lot of stuff to get through. So, to begin with, you know, I, I talk about my Area 51 sighting and, you know, what that might have been. And then I get into, uh, I've been very fortunate to have known people. Again, I feel a bit like sort of Forrest Gump in all of this, in that I've sort of wandered through it. I, I didn't know, for example, when Ingo Swan contacted me after the Hump Zero Point came out going, oh, I've just read your book. Do you ever come to New York? Um, it'd be great to meet. And yeah. the following year, I went to New York, I met Ingo, and then we sort of became friends. And I uh, only bit by bit did I become aware that of his huge significance in the world of remote viewing. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then when he died, I his family contacted me and said, would I write a biography about him? And I said, well, I can't add to the sum of knowledge about Ingo. You know, everyone's written about him and he himself has written about himself a lot um but we did find a couple of manuscripts which we bound up into a volume called resurrecting the mysterious which again that helped me come to terms with another slice of reality the real reality that i would not otherwise have come to terms with and i did that through ingo posthumously and his work so we do a bit of that um and then and I get into a bit of sort of the whole, well, what is reality? And um, I, I'm probably, again, I'm, if I'm sounding uncomfortable here, it's because I am, I, I, I have my, my map, it's somewhere to the left of my desk. The whole map of the book is, is, is very carefully constructed and a bit like painting by numbers, but a bit more than that. I will be filling it out every fortnight posting the chapters. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because, again, I'm using some of those thriller tropes um, to, to, to keep the narrative flow going. Um, and so, but I do end up, I do end up talking about how it affects each and every one of us. And again, in a hopeful way saying, and you've made up the point already, James, that, you know, if if you if you tune in to a degree, if you look beyond, you know, the, the 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 very real everyday things that we're confronted with, which sort of dull our senses and, and you know, why not? Because it, just living in Earth school is is hard. Um, <laughs> but if you get sort of beyond that. I think there are aspects to appreciating that we form part of a much bigger thing, which is still, for all of our efforts or collective efforts to understand it, is numinous, mysterious. Um, and, you know, I think on one level, we are never going to understand it. But in it somewhere, there is something hopeful and uh given to us which can lighten our load if we allow it to and and so 
that ultimately is where it's headed. I mean, again, I've been fortunate in my career and I've done lots of different writing, one of them as a ghost writer. So I ghost written, for example, some time ago, the works, the books of a very eminent psychiatrist. I would not have understood the workings, and I don't clearly in fullness, but I would have, wouldn't have begun to appreciate the workings of the human mind if I'd not been led to that project. Um, so even in the weird jigsaw of my own life, I'm saying, you know, if you if you allow it to and you look back on it, it does make a kind of sense. And this book is certainly not, it's not meant to be about me. All I, I am the journeyman narrator, if you like, who goes through this stuff, introducing interest to me, interesting concepts, chapter by chapter. Um, and in that sort of strange Forrest Gump like way that I've alluded to, I've sort of thought, well, how did I end up here? What, why am I rubbing shoulders with Ingo Swan? How did I have this meeting with Uri Geller? How did I meet Ben Rich? How did I, you know, so I, I'm able to relate it, hopefully, in a way that it makes, I, I, I only hope that it is readable. If it's readable, then I've done my job. But it's it's designed to pull you in, sustain you on the journey and go, oh, OK, well, perhaps I've understood a little bit more about the consciousness journey as it related to that bloke who's telling the story than I did before. Yeah. And um, where where can people find your work? So my uh, my own books um, are all on Amazon. Um, uh, I think I think they are all there, including the Ingo Swan book, Resurrecting the Mysterious, which graciously the family allowed me to co-author posthumously. I mean, posthumously with Ingo. Um, so they're all on there. I wrote a th the thriller I wrote called The Grid is available, obviously, electronically and as a real hard copy book. That, by the way, is about consciousness. It's, um, it, though it's fiction, it draws from very much from what I was learning around a decade ago in this. And uh, like I said earlier, I didn't have the credentials to begin to start speaking about consciousness. Um, funnily enough, until I got uh, onto the BICS um, research board as a research director. And then I felt, oh, hang on, maybe now I can actually say that I am a um, consciousness expert of sorts, but only by default, because I'm literally now rubbing shoulders with some great guys, you know, like Jeffrey Kripal's on the board and, um, uh, you know, other wonderful uh, Jeffrey Mishler is another one, you know, so yeah. some really good, good guys there. And I just happened to have, again, sort of so somehow turned up by default. Yeah. And you said this, the Substack is is now available. So I'm going to have uh, links in the description to everything. Do you have any parting words for the audience amidst this journey that you've been on? Uh, not really. I mean, I just feel that um in some senses i'm just getting started i mean i've really come to the consciousness uh subject so late and yeah you know, sometimes i kick myself and i go god why didn't i discover this stuff before because it's endlessly fascinating and, and you know you're you're never going to be bored if you dive into that pool because there's always something new to learn about it um but then i you know again as we've been saying you realize that you were introduced to it in the in the order or the uh, in the way that you were meant to be introduced to it you know i part of me thought why did i spend you know 20 years of my life um as a defense reporter you know it would have been so much more interesting if i'd graduated onto this stuff sooner well no i i, I feel even that was part of the foundation of you know what i'm now talking about so it's all there for a reason and i guess that's the thing that we should all bear in mind is that Everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason if you let it, if you allow it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I really look forward to uh, following the Substack and and uh, reading the book. It sounds fascinating. I especially want to hear about that gentleman's uh, that chapter with the interaction that gentleman had, uh, but also the 
the again you said in the beginning you're going to be discussing uh the disinformation counterintelligence aspect which i think is is critical um historically but also to understand the environment that we are currently in uh because that is at play and it will continue to be and we have to be cognizant of it and um be able to navigate it the best we can right um sure. so you know Thank you so much, Nick, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. I, I hope to talk to you again soon. And um, well, yeah, hope to sp- hope we speak again soon. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, James. All right. Take care.